All of this, of course, is tied in with the expansion of the Roman state. What Rome was becoming, how Rome was changing. That's the point of our century of crisis, the, the first century, because, of course, Rome was going from 100 B.C. down to zero, and in that 100 years, it was going, going from being a republic with all the elections and all the individuals coming to their offices and all of their senators in their robes coming into the uh, Senate and having their meetings almost every day. All of that is in 100, and by zero, much of it is gone or if still existing basically a show for where the real power was by that day the real power was up on the palatine hill in the palaces that were on the palatine hill the most important of which was the palace of augustus and the neighboring palace of his wife livia they each had their own territory, vast rooms that ran on and on, many, many servants, many, many members of the family, children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Uh, that's where the real power was. Now, the Senate was still meeting. They were still listening to speeches. and they still, But the true power was on the hill by zero, from 100 down to zero. And everybody knew that this was what was happening. Everybody in Rome knew that this was what was happening from the assassination in 44 down to 20 and then down to zero. All the Romans, people who lived in Rome and watched everything, saw Rome growing. Rome was approaching a million people, biggest city in the world. And in that time, everybody knew that the entire Roman state was being transformed right before their eyes. So why was it all happening? Well, number one, conquest and expansion. So as Rome kept getting bigger, the Roman state, and kept taking on new provinces like Gaul and then later Britain, as this happened, more and more of the Roman state could not be represented in Rome. There was just no way to do it. You couldn't fly people in from Gaul to be in the Senate. So what happened was slowly the Roman state government in the center of the empire represented a smaller and smaller percentage of the total citizenry of the empire. And no one had a solution as to how to have any of the other parts of the empire represented in Rome. They never found a solution. So as the empire expanded, just as the British empire expanded, the same thing happened. The British Empire expanded to North America, and there was no practical way that representatives elected in Boston could go to London and represent Boston. So the same thing was going to happen to the British Empire. But for Rome, they never found a solution. And so slowly, as these new parts of the empire are added, the generals become the local power. So a general in Britain is basically an independent operator. He's running an independent company, the British company. And he's running it day to day. He's appointing people, he's appointing military, he's appointing civilian, uh, and he's running basically a, a capital. In, in the case of Britain, York became a Roman capital, and the man running uh, Britain from York was a man named Constantine, father of Constantine. So soon, the father is going to be one of the three or four most powerful men in the Roman Empire because he's running a very prosperous uh, part of the empire, and his son will end up being Emperor Constantine. So expansion of the state, power of the generals, nobody knows what to do with it because it happens very fast. So for example, take Gaul. In 60, Gaul is outside the Roman Empire. They, they deal with the Gauls all the time in trade, in the Rhone River Valley, but it's an independent part of Europe. Various cities, various capitals, different tribes, very sophisticated. And then by 50, it's part of Rome. So all of a sudden, you have all these people in Rome from Gaul, all these people from Rome who have territory there. You have Roman generals and sub-generals and down the line who've been given property by Caesar to pay them off. And then you have 
a million or so captives being brought to Rome from the conquest. Because, of course, when you conquered a territory, the people in the territory became your captives. You could do whatever you wanted. You could leave them there. You could make them work at the farms. You could hand them over to Roman owners. Uh, or you could just pack them up and bring them to Rome and, ha and sell them in a slave market. Or sell them in some other slave market. That's what they did. Number two, dramatic expansion of wealth like nobody had ever seen in like one generation because of the huge expansion of the empire and the power of Rome. And that wealth gets more and more concentrated in the hands of a few people. So a Crassus, Marcus Crassus, was so rich that he could literally buy the government. And so the three of them together couldn't be stopped. They were essentially the end of the republic from then on. Then, and from then on, it was just who exactly was it? First it was three, then it was down to two, Pompey and Caesar, and then it's down to one. Some of our students have read other histories of Rome about Cicero, and they're suggesting that he doesn't come off as a, a great hero, that he sometimes is being portrayed as somewhat of a blowhard in it for himself. Well, of, of course all these things are true. I just kind of assume that we all know that, that we, it's hard to imagine that anyone operating in this high-powered atmosphere of Rome in 50 BC is uh, selfless, you know, and unselfish. Uh, no, he's not, he's not selfless and unselfish, except in the end, in the end, the last year, he is. He's a maneuverer, he's a schemer, he's trying to keep up with a growing wealth in his competitors that he can't match, so he's somewhat insecure. A tutor of his own horn, no question about it, Lots of tooting of his own horn, even in the Philippics, which is our last great piece of speech making. It's full of comments about how great he is, so that everybody will remember how great he is. And of course, you know, people have been known to do that. There are political leaders who tell you how great they are. I don't think anybody in any culture, not Britain, France, or any place else, is at the level of, of presidential politics, whether it's Rome or Britain or here, that is uh, just an unselfish saint. Because they're never going to be powerful if they're unselfish saints. So you have to have too much drive and ambition to be at the top. But Cicero isn't a buffoon. He isn't stupid. He's one of the most brilliantly educated men of his time, and it all comes through in his books and his ideas. So I think that uh, if someone's depicting Cicero as sort of a b either buffoonish or overly selfish, it's, they don't see the whole picture. Because the whole picture includes fall 43. You have to go to the end. You have to go up to the end of his life. And uh, we're going to get there. But if you think about it, by 43, he's, he's the last man standing from the Republican generation. He's the only person still alive who's important. Everybody else is gone. His courage in 43 is great. He doesn't have to go back to Rome. He could stay out in the country. He could better yet leave Rome and go to Greece. His, his dearest friend was over there and, was, and begging him to come. Come to Athens, you'll be fine. And he would have been fine. He could have had 20 more years of writing books and living in Athens. But he doesn't do that. So I see him as a great hero. And uh, I don't care about his flaws. I know that he's self-aggrandizing, but I don't care because, you know, so what? So you're self-aggrandizing and then you give your life at the last year of your life to your country to speak the truth? That's pretty great to me. I think that just kind of washes away all the sin. It just washes away all your sin. And then three, the huge influx into the capital because the capital was growing with so much wealth that if you were in the empire and you wanted a cut, the place to be was the, was the capital. Even if you were a general, even if you were a civilian representative out in Britain, you wanted to get to Rome if you could uh, because that's where the money was. A lot of that money is explained by number four, slavery.